Thanks for swimming up in the card pool. I'm your host, Stu. And I'm Kyle. And today, the name of the game is winning. In the words of DJ Cali, it's all I do is win. Ah, uh, you uh, stole my line again. I was just going to make that joke. I did not even think you knew who that music was. <laughs> Okay. Well, either way, that's awesome that you know it. And <laughs> secondly, what our magic moment is talking about are cards that literally say you win the game on. And these are mm -hmm. our personal favorites, the top five from Stu and Kyle Indeed. of what you could consider using in your decks. So at my number five, you don't mind me taking the lead, Kyle? Oh, no, please do. Is a card that we recently just talked about in a previous video. It's called Celestial convergence hmm. now this is a four drop enchantment it is a uh, two generic and double white and it's an enchantment that enters play with seven counters on it and at the beginning of each one of your upkeeps you go ahead and you remove one of these counters and if there are no more counters on this the game ends and the player with the highest life total wins the game however if there's a tie the game's a draw the end. The end. <laughs> end of the world. <laughs> so pretty much this is really cool because you can go ahead, you can blink this card, you can mess with the counters in a variety of ways to make it so that the clock is either going closer or further to midnight. And that is a great thing right there. It makes it so that you can go ahead and make it so that all players are playing a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more chaotic, and the game could possibly end before this goes off. It kind of instigates. Right, and it's interesting because it only requires you to have more life than everyone else. It doesn't have a specific life total. So this can be easily accomplished in a lot of strategies involving white because white, of course, is very good at gaining that life. Also, it does play very well with cards that take counters off of things, like a Hex Parasite, for example. That's a so great example. You can just win even faster with something like that in play. I mean, we also have a whole bunch of other stuff out there, like a Karn's Bastion, a land, which you can go ahead and use this kind of stuff. Right. And, I mean, if you're thinking of Solemnity, that one actually does not work with this one. That's I had point, to... Yeah. Uh, originally, I thought it did, and then I had to get retaught about it. Apparently, something like the counters have to initially get put on it first hmm. and removed. I don't know. I'm not a judge. Good point. But apparently that's something to note. So that's at my number five. Kyle, what is at the bottom of your list? All right. Well, it's still pretty good, I think. And speaking of counters, mine involves them as well. Simic Ascendancy is my number five. This is an enchantment that costs a, double, a green and a blue, those Simic colors. Got two abilities here. We have for three mana, one a green and a blue. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on a creature you control, put that many growth counters on Simic Ascendancy. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if Simic Ascendancy has 20 or more growth counters on it, you win the game. That's... It, that's not too hard to get to be pulled off. And, not at all. And, Especially when you consider some of the cards out there that use plus one, plus one counters. They get absurd amounts of them in one shot. Yeah. And while the, the, I like this because it, it comes out very early on turn two... And the fact that it fuels itself, yeah. which is great. It's not just dead in the water. It can go ahead and trigger its own way to yeah. win the game. And do, and do something that's actually like super relevant to the game and, and a lot of different decks. So And also, the, the, another like key factor for this card that makes it kind of amazing, in my opinion, is it triggers... It would have been easy for them to say, oh, well, every time you know one or more counters get put on a creature, you get one counter on this. But sure. no, it gets a growth counter for every single counter that goes on every single creature Which is at wild. all times. And if you think of how proliferate works with this, your head just starts kind of exploding a little bit. Yeah, you can make it so it, <laughs> it honestly doesn't take much to get there. But there are creature cards where it's like you go, like a spike weaver, more or less, mm -hmm. it enters play with so many counters on it. Those counters go towards this count. You can go ahead and make it so like you double counters with something like a doubling season. That also counts. That counts mm. twice right there for this enchantment right there, which is pretty wild. And, I mean, proliferating, you got a whole bunch of different mm. ways of moving counters. And, like, what, Azuri? The Simic Azuri, yeah. which goes ahead and, like, pretty much has many experience counters you have. These creatures get them. It, it's really not hard to pull off. This is an easy way to close it up the game, especially if you care about counters. Yeah, now the only complaint I have about this is that you know, uh, Simic Ascendancy. Well, where's my where are my other guild ascendancies? No, they, the they we don't need one for every guild. I honestly. feel like we do though, honestly. I'd we, say we really I'd do. I'd say Boros would would love to have one. But I think this is the beginning of a cycle that just never got. I finished, don't. And I, I hope it do gets not want a cycle point. of the. You know, <laughs> better we'll ask you guys out there. Uh, do you want to see this cycle continued? No. Yes or no. Yes. 
No. Yes. No. <laughs> Let's just go on to your next card still. All right, my number four is a card that's a little bit more recent that we've seen. Uh, it is called Mechanized Production. Now, this is an enchantment aura. It costs four mana, two generic, and two blue. And you enchant an artifact that you control. At the beginning of your upkeep, create a token copy of the enchantment that is enchanted, uh, the artifact that is enchanted. And if you control eight or more of that artifact with the same name, you win the game. So this card is great because it's kind of something you see with a progenitor mimic. It's giving you value off of value. It's creating a board state for you and it's self-propelled. You don't have to do any ifs, ands, or buts with that. Now also, depending on the type of artifact you choose, you might already be able to create a whole bunch of them. Like we see a lot of things with treasure tokens or gold tokens. If you go ahead, you put it on one of them and you have something like, I don't know, a smothering tithe out there, it's pretty easy to go ahead and get some of those count those guys out there so that it'll go around the table once and now you have enough to win the game. So this is a very high threat card. This is something that I think about a lot, including in different decks that I build. So there are pros and cons with it. The cons are that I don't really love ours in general. They're kind of iffy. You, hate you them. have to. You well, really do. They're, hate they're them. very iffy value wise, and you have to have a target in order for it to work at all. And it's something that can very easily get you two for one, and that's not a good feeling ever. Also, it's a win condition that people will see coming a mile away, and odds are you're not going to last eight turns once they see this hit the that's field. That's the slow way. However, the as as I said, there are pros and cons. The pros are, as you very adequately said. If there are generic tokens out of artifacts, like Fopters or Servos or Treasure Tokens or what have you, any number of these Mirrors things. Mirrors even. Yeah, even Mirror. So you could potentially win in as little as one turn with this card. It could be very surprising and people might not have a chance to stop you. So... Yeah, it has. It definitely the has. The only its problem moments. is it has to be on your upkeep. But again, blue can take extra turns. So you can go ahead, take an extra turn, get this to work out the right way, and then you just flat out win, which is good. And also, even if you're not using it to just flat out win, getting two of any artifact is nice. Two soul rings, awesome. Two lands that happen to be artifacts, that's awesome. Or go ahead and get some another blight steal for mm -hmm. four mana. Yeah, terrifying. So even if it doesn't work, you're still getting a decent field board. And because those tokens don't get wiped away when this is gone. So you do get value that will stay on the board. And that's something to note. Yeah, this card intrigues me. So I, I am very interested to see if at some point there is something that really combos very well with this. Yeah, I agree. So moving on to number four, Kyle, what do you got? Speaking of those artifact tokens, number four on my list is Revel in Riches. Once oh, again, I love an this enchantment. Card. I feel like there's a running theme here of what these cards are about. Uh, this is a black enchantment that costs five mana to play. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, create a colorless treasure artifact token. And treasures, of course, you can tap and sacrifice them to give you one mana of any color. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control ten or more treasures, you win the game. So... I would like to note that this card got even better recently with the changes to the commander rulebook that if your commander dies and you know either goes to the command zone or goes to the grave or whatever, it still counts as an additional die. The dies triggers trigger. are finally in effect for commanders, which is right. great. So this card, I have seen decks that use this to absurd value without even caring about the win the game part. Yeah. Just the fact that whenever you kill an opponent's creature, you get more mana. That's potentially extremely busted. And it's not even you killing them. It just has to die. Right. So, so it's a like, board wipe can give you a gazillion treasures. Exactly. Or like if they are going through some sort of sack outlet, like something as simple as like a skull clamp, and they're just going ahead to draw cards because mm -hmm. they're digging. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll take the free mana and uh, I'll pass your turn and let that guy go ahead and let me. So I get exactly. extra. Exactly. So, it's, yeah. It's <laughs> just, it, and that's also another thing. This is a versatile card that can be used whether it's going towards the win con or not not and also the big target on this makes them waste a form of spot removal which again players don't want to be forced to deal with stuff like this especially if it's making someone else potentially not get hit by something yeah so. and when this card is paired with smothering tithe extra dirty there's, there's so many things out there that this really goes <laughs> wild with and there's even was it some of the flip things that turn to the lands that go ahead and produce these and yeah great card great card so moving on Without to my doubt. number three, I also have a black card as well, mm -hmm. and this one is also an enchantment. It's yeah. called Liliana's Contract. It costs five mana, three generic, and double black. And it reads, when this enters the battlefield, you draw four cards and you lose four life. 
Okay, that's pretty good right there. But how do you win? Well, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control four or more demons with different names, you win the game. So, yeah. How many demons are in the game? A good bit. Yeah. And we even have demon tutorability, because, like, what's the one card that can go ahead? If you have enough of them, you sack them, you go ahead, and you get them. Well, there's a couple. I mean, there's a Blood Speaker, but also I think you're thinking of Shadowborn Apostles. Shadowborn uh, Apostles yeah. decks. And they have no problem bringing them out to the field and cheat them into play. So if you're just using good value on demons, yeah, this is fine. And also the good thing about this is like, sure, if you create demon tokens, as long as you have enough other demons out there, that can still go towards the total, yes, which is great. And based on when you play this, you might already have a board state to win. Yeah, I like the fact that this gives you immediate advantage when it comes into play, the drawing the cards. That's cool in my book. I just think that the, the win condition here requires a little more jumping through hoops than I'm normally comfortable with. Yeah, it's, it's a little easy, you almost want to say. But again, demons are usually pretty high cost. Exactly. So you, you could make some fun combos with changelings and conspiracy and, and xenograft and cards like that. Maybe that could help out. But overall, I don't know. I mean, having those four demons in play is maybe a little difficult to start. And then obviously when people see what you're trying to do, they're not going to let it happen. You know, I like so. I like what you're saying about the conspiracy and, ch and changelings because typically people are like, all right, yeah, he's got like three mice or rats or whatever out there or something like that or a couple of humans. And they'll forget that they are changed to different types or that they are every type. And you can maybe slide out a win with just because they're not paying enough attention. Yeah, or, by just, or by just playing one of those cards when you have enough creatures on the field and then making people scramble to stop you. So Yeah, and we are seeing more flash in black, so it possibly could be like someone ends the turn, on the end of the turn, you bring in a demon. And also we do see some demon commanders out there that are pretty mm -hmm. good, which can only go to the count of this, which is awesome as well. It's possible, so it'll be an interesting card for sure. So Kyle, you're number three. I got a question for you after you're finished going through it, but like, right. just go into <laughs> it real fast and we'll touch on it. Okay, well my number three, and for those who like to play Commander, especially competitive Commander, this will be no surprise, Thassa's Oracle. This is a relatively new card Very from Theros Beyond card. Death that has really kind of reshaped how we play the game just by itself. So it's called 1-3 Merfolk Wizard that costs two mana to play. When Thassa's Oracle enters the battlefield, look at the top X cards of your deck, where X is your devotion to blue. Put up to one of them on top of your deck and the rest on the bottom in any order, or a random order, I should say. If X is greater than or equal to the number of cards in your deck, you win the game. So the reason I put this card on the list is because this has, uh, at this point, kind of taken over the traditional spot that has been reserved for Laboratory Maniac. That's exactly which what was, was a very ask. yeah a very famous blue card that you know if you draw if you are going to draw a card but you have no cards left in your deck you win the game. So when this was printed, this kind of pushed Laboratory Maniac completely out of the format and replaced it, and for good reason I think because it is better in almost every respect. Like, I, I've, I've talked about this before. Do I really need to go into, again, why this is better? I well, feel like it's pretty obvious. So there are, like, three notorious cards of this. We have the Thoth, which is the newer one. We have the old school boy, which is Laboratory Maniac. And then we have the kind of forgotten child in the middle, which is the Jace. The Jace Wielder of Mysteries, yeah. Which is, like, okay, out of these three... How do you rank which one higher? Like, sure, one's a triggered ability, mm -hmm. one's an activate active ability. Uh, well, the Planeswalker is also an active ability, but it's also... It can do little, other things. It can do too. other things as well. So, out of these three, which one's the best? I'll tell you which. Thassa's Oracle, Jace, Labman. That's how it See, works. I don't think so. I think what I would say is Labman, Thassa, Jace. No, see, Laboratory Maniac is a much worse card than this, and there's a very simple reason that it is, because other than its ability to win you the game under a certain condition that, granted, is very easily met, Laboratory Maniac is a 2-2 body for three mana that does nothing the vast majority of the game. It, yeah. This, Thassa's Oracle, can come out as early as turn two, and even if you're not trying to win the game with it, it still gives you some great value. It's good. It's basically a scry two on a card. Blinking decks love it. Blue value decks love it. Very much everywhere. Well, and it. tribal, it's good for both yeah, tribes right there. of course it is. But again, the other one being able to like not have to reserve mana, not have to worry about something getting countered. Like usually you have to worry about a triggered ability or an activated ability getting countered, which is harder with Lab Maniac and even the Jace. But the Jace, again, the counters can go down. So I get what you're saying. It's like dead cards in your hand. And you know, we'll do a poll right here. Um, which, 
which one would you rather use? Oracle, the Jace, or the Lab? We'll do a mm -hmm. poll right here. You choose one of the three and you let us know. And uh, if you disagree with Kyle in any way, or me, let us know in the comments <laughs> down below. But yeah. moving on to my number two, Stu's number two. We're going to be looking at a card that I've loved. I've always wanted to put in decks, and I just haven't. <laughs> but, like, it's, it's great. Uh, it's called Helix Pinnacle. Now, this is an enchantment that costs one green, and it has Shroud. For X mana, right, you put X amount of tower counters on Helix Pinnacle. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have 100 or more tower counters, you win the game. <laughs> so this is something that you really sink your mana into because you need at least 100 mana throughout the game. Hmm. And sure, the ideal play is play this out on turn one. They can't spot removal it, which is great. They have to legit go ahead and do mass board destruction on enchantments, which you don't really see much of, or enchantments and artifacts, which is a little bit more seen. Hmm. Any extra mana you have will go into this at any point. Now, also, if you are able to go ahead and double your mana, triple your mana, boost your mana in any kind of way, we have Nyx Bloom, we have Mirari's Wake, we have uh, Zendikar Resurgence, we have Doubling Season, a Doubling Cube. I mean, the list goes on and on, and you have untapping mechanisms to go ahead and use this. And we have Proliferate stuff these days. You can put those counters on it in other ways, but I'll... Or like... well, no, no, because it has Shroud. You can't target it. Well, Proliferate doesn't target. Oh, okay. I, I, I sit corrected. Yeah, so... I just think, I think that with this card, like, obviously, you, can it win you the game under the right circumstances? Yes, very easily. However, if you're making infinite mana, you gotta have better things to do with it than this. Like, come on. But this is a route for Enchantress decks, and again, this is something that could work at just mono green without anything else with it. Except, like, if you're going non-degenerate, this works. Because, like, some people, they don't like playing with infinite combos. Some people, they don't like buying expensive cards because they're used for combos. This is just a standalone card that can be good in any deck that just happens to produce a lot of mana. But it doesn't do anything on its own. That's my problem. What makes this better than Simic Ascendancy? Not a whole lot. <laughs> that uh, I chose it and not you. <laughs> Obviously. No, uh, no, I get what you're saying. I, I, it's not as flashy as some of the newer cards that we're seeing with these, but it's just a card for me personally has a little bit of nostalgia. It probably should be more like on the number four of my list or anything like that, but it's a card, again, it's always kind of been elusive for me to build with. <laughs> and I just, again, kind of being a green player, it's just one of those ones, like it makes me smile knowing that green's got a win con just in mono green like that. Yeah, it's not, it's not bad. It's pretty cool. I'll admit it. But number two for Kyle. Yes, indeed. Number two. This is a very scary card and one that I enjoy playing with all the time. Hellkite Tyrant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is a six-mana dragon. Six-five with flying and trample. Whenever Hellkite Tyrant deals combat damage to a player, gain control of all artifacts that player controls. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control 20 or more artifacts, you win the game. So... Yeah, not only is this thing just a, a really it's a power awesome house. creature in general, stealing all artifacts from a player potentially, like mana rocks, creatures, whatever it is, can be backbreaking on its own. And then you just have the additional, oh, by the way, if you have enough artifacts, you just kind of win. Which is okay. amazing. <laughs> and this card's only gotten better with time. We see a new goblin that is called Treasure Nabber, which if yeah. you use your artifacts, I get them. So even for some reason, if this card's pacified and can't attack, you still get the win con. It doesn't have to be on your side because this creature brought him there, which is yeah. the best part about it. And, and it has flying, so it's easily able to get in for that damage that it needs. And then to add insult to injury, they gave it trample too. So it's like, yeah, you just cannot yeah. stop this from doing this, what it's going to do. This is one of the better dragon cards. It's awesome in Dragon Tribal because it has that dragon win kind of thing. It's like, yeah. I have my giant horde of treasure kind of thing. And it... Like, yeah, if I have my giant horde, I'm happy yeah. I should win. And who in Commander at this point is not going to be packing a Soul Ring, an Arcane Signet, other Signets, other Mana now, Rocks, what have you. 20 yeah. might be a little hard to get. Like, some decks only use five of them or something like not that. Not really. You'd be surprised at how fast no, that No, 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 no. I, I know it adds up. But again, it's like there are some decks that really don't care about their artifacts so much. They care more about instants and sorceries or they care more about creatures. Like, every deck uses artifacts. There's no denying that. But... Being able to get them solely from your opponents, you need to make sure your deck has enough artifacts to make sure this is a reality. Like, again, 
plan, plan on they don't have any and just make it work. But this is one of those cards that I play every time I can. I don't care about necessarily winning with it. It's just a good card. No, it's a great card. The it's, win is just icing on the cake if you can do it. Yeah, it's, it's like running Insurrection. It doesn't matter how good the creature is. The fact is that you have the yeah. creature. And the good thing also is when this dies, you still keep the artifacts. Exactly. Which is the better part about this. It's a great long-term effect. So, like, keeping someone Soul Ring... They now have to destroy it because it has turned treason on them. <laughs> exactly. But moving on to our number one. Now, these are the cards that we are saying yeah. to take the most note of. <laughs> and mine, I know, is going to get a lot of turned up noses, but I am on a total high on this card because I've been using it to crush Kyle lately. It's, it's called Approach of the Second Sun. Now, it is a it sorcery. It is annoying, I'll admit. It is a fun, annoying card, and I just can't help but love it. It costs seven mana, six generic, and a white. And it reads, if you cast this card uh, from your hand and you've casted another card, name this card, you win the game. Otherwise, if this is the first time you cast it, put this card uh, in your deck, making it the seventh from the top, and you gain seven life. So pretty much the whole thing about this is you're trying to make it so that the sun comes back around again. That's the whole flavor text mm. You cast this once, all right, put it back in the deck, get your seven life, and in, in a slow game, seven turns, it'll come back, you just recast it. The fun thing about this is if this gets countered the first time, it still counts towards exactly, it. Exactly, which is part of what makes this actually an acceptable card. Yeah, because, like, again, Commander, you're like, all right, I only run one copy of this. Well, that's the good thing about this, that it goes back into the deck for you. You can go ahead and make it so, like, I don't need to run a second copy, which is something that you do see a problem with some other win cons out there. But the fact is, is, like, all right, how hard is it to get this? We have a whole refresh and, and cycling. We have a whole bunch of commanders that care about stuff at the top of your deck. You have cards like Scroll Rack, Sensei's Divining Top. You have a whole bunch of ways to mill things out. You, it's really not that hard to go ahead and cast this in one turn and then make it so the card's in your hand the same turn or recast in that same turn yeah, as well. Yeah, turns out it's actually not that difficult. It really isn't. I made a deck with Golos that's all about cycling, and this is the main win cut. If you're interested in that, we'll go ahead and put a link in the description down below so you can check it out. But typically that deck wins... wins at least by turn eight. Well, and something like Bolus's Citadel makes this card Easier. even better as well. And even Golus's effect, go ahead, use it a couple times. This is in there. And yeah. now there are ways to protect this. There are lands like Basoju and stuff like that to mm -hmm. make it so like, all right, this is uncounterable. Or you just run counter spells or anything else. It's yeah. it's great. It's honestly so great and it's become like a new staple in my magic plays. So moving on to your number one, Kai, I bet it's a little bit more flashy than this. All right, well, not exactly, but it is in the same kind of uh, design uh, sort of template here. Number one on my list is going to be Felidar Sovereign. Uh, so it's white. Now this is, yeah, another white card, a creature this time. So it's a cat beast, costs six mana to play, four six with Vigilance and Lifelink. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have 40 or more life, you win the game. Which... Ooh, 40 life. Where does that sound familiar oh, from? Oh, I wonder if that's exactly how much life we start with. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> Thank so you, Wizards. Potentially, if you come up with some really kind of stupid, I don't know how you would do it play, you could potentially win on turn one with this card. If Yeah, like if you get the right kind of ramp, or I mean, just the Sarah's Ascendant, you just go ahead and just play it out turn one, get enough life. Sure, you can take the hits and still be above 40 and right. win. And you can cheat this card into play at any time, probably win. You play this later in the game, probably win. I love the fact that this is a decent creature by itself. It also has lifelink, so it can help you do the work. It can help you get there which if you really do need it. And also, cats have finally started getting the support that they deserve. Yeah. So this can work in those tribal builds to make it so that this thing can come out and be a little bit more aggressive if you need it so it's not as dead in the hand. Also, a 4-6 with Vigilance, great. A 4-6 with Vigilance and lifelink, great. Yeah, like you really can't beat this in terms of the ease of winning the game. Say you're playing Commander, put yeah, this card in your deck, and win. And now <laughs> That's again, all there is to the it. The reason why we have chose these cards, the cards themselves had to physically say, you win the game. Sure, like, you know, Aether Hub is a card that you you pretty much should win the game with, but it doesn't yeah, say Aether it. Flux Reservoir, Aether Flux Reservoir, yeah. my bad, I apologize for that. Like, like, some people would say that's a better card than this one. However, it doesn't have that clause, and these cards are strictly limited to the ones that are in that. Exactly. Plus... 
I, I kind of I love this card so much because I will never forget um, when I was playing my when I was playing my old Lazav Demir Mastermind deck, making other people mill cards and stealing their creatures from it. I will never forget the time that on like the third turn of the game, I just randomly milled some other player, made them mill this card, made Lazav a copy of it, and then the next turn was mine, and I just won the game because nobody had touched that's, me yet. You know what? That's one of those moments you just kind of like when yeah, you swap in magic never stories. Forget. You're like, oh, you won't believe it. this one time I did it. Like, that's actually a pretty good one. Well, it's, it it's so stupid. Well, it's like the ones where it's like, all right, I'm gonna chaos uh, warp. And, and I'll get rid of this little whatever, and then out comes Blightsteel. Yeah. And you're like, that problem got way worse. Yeah. <laughs> it's like one of those kind of, you just don't forget them. And yeah, they're great. exactly. <laughs> but these are some of the win cons that we love as of just standalone cards that just win you the game in their own text box. There are more out there, but let us know which ones that you like using. And if you have any fun stories like that, and you're like, oh, I've done this or this, or even what deck you use them, let us know in the comments down below, and we'd love to hear it. Definitely. And, of course, you can follow us for more content, whatever kind of content you're looking for, on social media. We've got some Reddit pages. We've got a subreddit, and we post on others pretty frequently there. We have a tapped out page where we put all of our awesome deck lists with more cards like this. And also, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and you can find us all at the handle The Card Pool. So look us up. Yep, Definitely. and if you're on any other new so forms of social media, type it in. You might find us as well. But also, we are affiliated with TCG Player, so if you're interested in getting any of these win cons there in your go. deck, yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> there. Yeah. Um, be sure to go ahead, add them to your cart, but before you go ahead and check out, click on the link. It lets them know that you got sent there from us and that they should go ahead and take note and help support our channel. So that would help us out a lot if you do that, and thank you if you do. All right, great. But until then, I'm Stu. And I'm Kyle. And we'll, and we'll see, see you next time at, at the, the card, card Pool. pool. You just gotta love like that approach to the second song. Just All you so do much is fun. win, 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 win. That's not how the song. <laughs> I don't believe I don't you know, know the song. <laughs>